All right. Well, I see we have a few people joining now. That's great. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started shortly. We'll just uh, give it a few minutes and uh, wait for everyone to join. But uh, welcome, everyone. And you know, while we're waiting, feel free to say hello. Uh, there's a little chat link there at the bottom there. Go ahead and say hello and let us know where you're joining in from um, and maybe tell us what you're hoping to uh, learn today. I, uh, I definitely want to thank everyone that's joined early. I certainly appreciate your enthusiasm. Uh, I do also want to remind everyone that this meeting is going to be recorded um, and we are going to be sending over everyone a recording of this webinar along with the deck presentation that Stuart will be doing. Can everyone hear me okay? I hope I'm not too loud. My, uh, my wife tells me I speak too loud, so. No, you have to, you have to interpret that as passion. Passion, yes, I'm very, very passionate. <laughs> it's not loud, it's passion. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Yeah, so um, yeah, we're gonna give it a few more minutes, um, but uh, would love to hear where everyone's from. Let us know what you're excited to hear about today. Uh, Stuart, um, I've actually known Stuart for about, I'd say eight or nine years now. Um, Definitely highly recommend him and E2R services. It's kind of like my go-to um, HR legal firm when it comes to um, you know, support from a, from a legal standpoint and HR standpoint. A little bit of uh, info from myself. Um, you know, I'm the, the head of partnerships at Humi, but um, you know, I've met Stuart when I was working with uh, Ceridian and I've, I've been with Hi Bob, I've been with uh, Rise, I've been with quite a few different vendors and um, you know, HR comes up all the time and, and Stuart's always there to support my clients when there may be some need around HR and legal advisory. Uh, one nice thing I liked about Stuart's model is it's, it's a subscription model, right? So um, very affordable services to support you with uh, HR and legal advisory services, written documentation. Uh, Stuart, feel free to jump in there. I hope I'm not overstepping there on your service models. But, no, um, I, I got to take you everywhere on the dog and pony shows. <laughs> you got to come with me. But no, that's exactly what we do. It's very, very uh, modest fee structure for very robust HR and legal support. So it's uh, it's a pretty nice one-stop shopping. Uh, couldn't be more convenient uh, and uh, hence uh, gratifying success of the program. It's 21 years now across that's Canada. Awesome. Yeah. And, and so I've been to many of your webinars and events, and um, I'm just so excited to be part of this webinar today. I just love the way that you present. Uh, very insightful, but also very engaging. So how are we right now? We, we still got a couple more that we'd want to join in here. I see there's a lot of people adding into the chat there where they're all from. I'm from the East Coast. Uh, I actually moved from Ontario out to St. John's, Newfoundland. Uh, loving it out here. You got some cloudy weather and raining heavily today. <laughs> that's the only time it's ever happened though, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's that's never right. happened previously. But you can see everybody's from right across Canada. It's wonderful. Right across Canada. It's absolutely wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the East Coast. Bye. Yeah. I'm uh, I'm working on my, my new feeling out here. Yes, bye. <laughs> So I get, I see a lot of people saying hello. It'd be, I'd love to hear if anyone wants to share about what they're hoping to learn from today. Um, that'd be awesome. All right. Well, I think we're going to get started. That's been about five minutes, and I, I know everyone's got a busy work day today. So uh, let's get started. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today. My name is Matt Byler, and I head the partnerships team here at Humi. Uh, very excited to facilitate this session as we explore the challenges and opportunities of flexible work arrangements. Uh, one of the most transformative shifts in the workplace in the recent years. The, uh, the last few years have redefined how we work, blending remote, in office and hybrid models into the new norm. Uh, while flexible work arrangements existed pre-pandemic, their adoption has reached new heights, uh, requiring us as leaders to adapt and ensure these models are both sustainable and effective for our business. 
So today we're thrilled to have Stuart Dukoff, a, a seasoned employment and labor lawyer, a Canadian HR leader and founder of E2R, uh, join us today. Stuart will share his expertise on the legal and HR considerations critical to implementing and maintaining successful, uh, flexible work strategies, helping you navigate uh, this evolving landscape. A little bit about Humi. Uh, we are a modern Canadian employment platform. We understand that managing people in this new era involves more than just great tools. It's about the blend of technology and expert guidance. As a Canadian employment platform, we support businesses across the country with robust SaaS technology while partnering with leaders like Stuart to bring essential insights and strategies to the table. Uh, before we dive in, here's how today's webinar is going to run. So we do have some interactive elements. Uh, we're going to have some live polls and opportunities for Q&A throughout. Uh, for the questions that you may have, feel free to submit them as we go. Um, we'll address them all at the very end of the presentation. And if we can't get to all of your questions, we're certainly going to make sure that we follow up with you. So with that said, uh, let's dive into navigating the new norm of flexible work arrangements with Stuart Dukoff. Thanks, Matt, and thank you all for attending. Um, totally unrelated, but you'll see there is a more than, a, I guess, a tangential relationship. So my son who's 12, on Sunday I asked him, I said, you know, do you have any homework? And he goes, no, I got nothing. And I said, well, I've got a lot of work to do. How is that fair that you don't have any work and I got tons of it? And he says, huh, I guess my life's better than yours. And, you know, it makes me think about all these flexible work arrangements and you have differing perceptions of what ought to be. And as many of you know, probably just reading in the media, the federal public service is up in arms over the additional day to return to the office from two to three. So there is a um, there are differing views as to what should and ought to happen, uh, but that's what makes it very very interesting uh, for each organization. So let's start with our agenda. Thanks, Will's going to be helping out um, with our agenda. So we're gonna start with the fall of tradi the traditional workplace, which of course we're all very familiar with. Uh, some of the flexible work arrangements that are common, the hybrid, remote, flex time, compressed work week. We'll touch on some of those uh, designs as it were for the flexible work uh, environment. The benefits of flexible work arrangements, of course, presumably organizations would not be pursuing it unless there were benefits. And indeed there are, but you know there's a but, right? And the but is there are risks and there are considerations uh, that all organizations have to direct their collective minds to as it relates to the imposition of flexible work arrangements. And we'll chat about some of those, obviously in the time we have, uh, we can't do a whole lot more than draw your attention to them, but uh, sensitizing you is important. Uh, certainly the policies and agreements that organizations ought to consider entering into, uh, because of course, when you're talking to a lawyer, although half of me is a lawyer, the other half is a Canadian human resources leader, so I'm not necessarily on that other half of Canadian human resources leader as, uh, let's call it, uh, as dedicated as it were uh, to documentation because it's not always appropriate. And then we'll have some concluding remarks. Okay, let's get started. It's a robust agenda to say the least. So uh, let's go, Will, to the first slide that follows. Oh, we got the poll already. Yeah, look at that. All right. All right. I like so, it. Poll question is, does your organization permit remote work? And this is where there's gambling. We know there's a there's a market out there where there, people are gambling now, what the percentage is going to be. Yeah. 
presumably it's going to be high, one would think, but it depends on the nature of, of course, the nature of the industry. Yeah, no surprise, 87% uh, have identified that their organization permits remote work. And of course, there are gradations to it um, as to what exactly remote work would mean in any given environment. But just, you know, if we answered this in, if we asked this question in 2019, I guess is the answer would be materially different um, other than for sales forces, et cetera. Okay, let's go to, so the fall, anybody heard of the COVID-19 pandemic? Um, probably all of us are well aware of it, understand the differences and perspectives have occurred, certainly around wellness, work-life balance have accelerated since then. So people are looking for flexibility uh, in their sort of work-life balance. Uh, job applicants are definitely pursuing flexible work arrangements. Uh, just give you the example in the legal field. I just happened to look, happened to look on LinkedIn and saw there was this ad for some in-house employment uh, law position. And it was readily apparent that the only position that offered fully remote, the applicant ratio was about six to one versus the other competing organizations for those lawyers. So whether... Some organizations wish, wish to resist it or not, there's the reality out there. And certainly the workplace is broadened anywhere you work, right? At home, a coffee shop has now become the workplace. Um, so it's not a new concept to us now, the flexible work arrangements, but there are challenges and we're gonna discuss, of course, some of the risks here as we go through. But the bottom, the point at the bottom right, is really an underlying theme throughout. And this is sort of the lawyer hat on. And the lawyer hat on says, well, you better employer reserve the discretion as to whether you're going to maintain those flexible work arrangements, whether you're going to repeal them in their entirety, whether you wish to amend them, and perhaps the notification period or no notification period as it relates to those changes. The bottom line being, you need to ensure from a legal perspective that as the employer, you're reserving your right to make changes or indeed remove it in its entirety. Next slide, please. So, some of these you're probably familiar with, certainly the hybrid work model, which is something we see. It's very prevalent uh, out there in, in work land, as it were, where you have people splitting their time between the office uh, and working at home. And certainly they can vary. Some people will come in on certain days. It can be a rotating schedule. You can elect to pick certain days and have some mandatory days, right? But what's the rationale? The rationale is we need some collaboration opportunity. So that's why we need to be together to encourage that collaboration. And each environment will have its own incentives for wanting to achieve that. But ultimately, that's the underlying theme. And so that's why we want people together. And you will hear certainly the senior people who have developed their networks, they're very um, receptive to a beneficial hybrid work model because they have their networks. They know where to secure the information or the support that they need. Whereas the junior employees don't have that network, don't have that experience and require more mentoring. And in many environments, mentoring is achieved through ad hoc interactions with more senior people. That is very difficult for that to occur using Teams platforms, et cetera. Clearly not impossible, but arguably more difficult. The remote work model, of course, you work remotely. 
And that is in many, many environments now where it's 100% remote. And we're going to talk about remote work agreements as it relates to payroll. You'll see that shortly on which province would govern your payroll deductions. But certainly remote work is a certainly a characteristic of our work environment now. Next slide, please. Flex time. So it's another opportunity for a flexible work arrangement where the employee gets that greater latitude. They choose their hours of work or they can change their work schedule from one week to the next, depending on their personal needs. Bearing in mind, this is the major underlying theme of why flexible work arrangements are appealing to employees. They can attend to a wide variety of their personal matters and incorporate work as part of that. Uh, so the example you see is required to work a standard number of core hours within a specified period. That's it. And then there's greater flexibility in starting and ending times. The compressed work week, which many of you would be familiar with just from a understanding the unionized environment, you often see uh, the idea that employers are going to work only four days and work 10 hour days, for an example, and have that Friday, as it were, uh, off. So you still do the 40 hours using that as an example, but you do it in a compressed period of the week. Well, it has real benefits, right? So once again, various ways to approach it. Next slide, please. So benefits, and we've sort of touched on these in part already. Many of you would have certainly your own perspectives given your organization, but as I just touched on moments ago with the law firm assisting in recruiting efforts. And as we all know, if, if a position is 100% remote, you can be where Matt is in Newfoundland and right, the head office could be in Vancouver or Toronto, doesn't matter, right? Because although we're going to talk about some of the, let's just call it the risks as it were for doing that. But think about the ability to recruit across Canada for positions. You have opened up a pool of candidates far more significant than you had previously. So the talent pool, of course, expands. Worker morale. Obviously, what we're talking about, the underlying theme is to permit employees to manage both their personal and work. And you have, I'll keep using Matt, Matt wants to develop the Newfoundland accent. That's been his lifelong dream. And so there he is out there pursuing that dream while at the same time, uh, right, working copious hours for whom he. Um, managing employee attendance and reducing absenteeism. Well, if I can't make it to work because of a variety of situations that have arisen personally, but I can manage it from my home environment. Well, and for example, if I'm sick, I'll stay home. I can still do the work. I don't feel well, but had, if I had to go in physically to the premises, I wouldn't have gone in. I feel like CR asterisk P, right? So I'm not gonna go in, but this way I can still manage the work. Retention of good workers, of course, if you enjoy a flexible work arrangement, uh, it's one of the attractions of staying in that environment that offers it. Boosting productivity, you're going to have different perspectives on that. Uh, there are many, of course, that will take the view that we're far more productive in a remote work environment, simply because it's available in effect to us all the time. And we manage more effectively our personal matters so we can be time efficient and therefore devote uh, work time. Whereas others uh, will take the position that it's not productive, there are too many distractions. And just using the example I identified moments ago, but the junior employee who simply is not getting the mentoring that that employee ought to have, well, that's impacting that employee's productivity. The better work-life balance for workers, self-evident. That's what we're talking about, right? This second to last point, interesting point, carbon emissions and workplace footprints. Well, if I'm not traveling, just using transportation as that footprint, well, maybe from an environmental perspective, there is a benefit. 
And also this idea of emergency circumstances, right? Um, in Newfoundland, every now and then there are weather uh, issues. I don't know if Matt's aware of that, if he went there and thought it was Hawaii. Um, but there are situations, and if you have an infrastructure where you have remote work that's successfully achieved, well, you're probably in a better situation to respond to certainly a weather uh, circumstance and indeed other circumstances. Mm -hmm. Next slide, please. Stuart, Stuart I have a yeah. question for you. Actually. Sure. So, so if an employer in its remote work policy appropriately reserves like the discretion to end or amend the policy, but has permitted work for uh, remote work for an extended period of time, does it lose the right to rely on the policy to end or amend that re remote work? No, and that's a good question because yes, over time, uh, you could create employee expectations that say, wow, we've been doing this three, four, five years now. Um, and so we think that ought to persist for the next four to five years. The answer to that is no, though, um, because if you've incorporated properly in the policy and the policy has been communicated to employees and with most policies, you ought to have them, um, you should re -immerse the employees in your policies on an annualized basis and indeed even have them sign off. Uh, that's a great idea. So how can an employee take the position, oh, I didn't know that the employer reserved the discretion? Well, no, the employer did reserve the discretion. It set out in the policy. It was communicated to you and you were reminded of it on an annualized basis. So the perception of unfairness, maybe that's a different issue, an HR issue perhaps, but from a legal standpoint, Matt, no, I think you can rely on that policy. That's the whole point of reducing it to writing and properly communicating it. Mm -hmm. So, great. Yeah. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay, sir, I, I have like a, I was just chatting with a friend actually, and he moved out of province, right? And he works yeah. for a large organization and they, they had like a remote kind of, you know, uh, re relationship, right? So I guess my question to you is, if an employee is moved to a different province without the knowledge of the employer, mm -hmm. will that province's employment standards and occupational health and safety legislation still apply? Well, it's an excellent question. And we're going to, we're actually anticipating it. Well, we're going to touch on that in a couple of uh, future slides here. But y the short answer is, in all likelihood, yes. So that employee who resides in that other province now, who's performing the work 100% remotely, in all likelihood, the local legislation, as it were, occupational health and safety, employment standards, workplace safety and insurance, all those will have application to that employee now. So as the organization, you ought to be aware of your obligations pursuant to that legislation, because it now has application to that employee. So yes, um, you've got to pay attention and don't, you know, you can be a, an accommodating employer and that's great. Um, and you can say, oh yeah, sure, go ahead, you know, go to Newfoundland and uh, pick up the accent and work with that and enjoy the beautiful weather. But now you have Newfoundland legislation applying. Right. And so as the employer, you need to make sure you have an awareness of anything that, of course, would uh, impact your situation. So, uh, yes, uh, it's it, it, it's important. And that's what we'll touch on in a few moments. Um, so I see the slide in front of me changes the term. So. One of the <laughs> so if you have, let's say you have uh, you don't you haven't reserved the right in a policy to, to to make changes. And the employee has worked remotely, let's say for four or five years, beginning of the pandemic, 2020, right? We're going on five years. So you've worked remotely for five years and then the employer just says, well, now why don't you come to the office? Huh? The employee's gonna go, yeah, but I've been five years, I've been working remotely. I, I, I'm up at the cottage. I, I don't even have, I sold my place in the in the city. Well, that employee could allege and has a legitimate argument that that employee has been constructively dismissed because it's a fundamental term of the employment relationship now, this idea of permitting the employee to work remotely. You don't 
reserve anything in a policy or in a contractual agreement. So you've elevated, in effect, this employee's ability to work remotely as a term of employment. And then all of a sudden, you're pulling the rug out from under the employee's remote feet, as it were. And that could constitute a constructive dismissal, permitting the employee to resign and sue for severance. So that can be a very dangerous scenario. So that's why uh, you want to, once again, as you see in that second bullet point, reserve the right to modify or cancel the agreement. In the absence of that, you have a potential serious situation, i.e. constructive dismissal. Next slide, please. So let's look at some, as you raised, Matt, some of those issues, right? So you want to be aware of the location where remote employees are working. So the employment standards, of course, using the example. So now if Matt's in Newfoundland, well, what are the employment standards? Terms that apply to him. Hours of work. Oh, he's probably a, man he's a manager, so none of that will probably apply to him. But public holidays and vacation, right? Termination entitlement. Right. There's a, obviously all those fundamental terms that are the subject of employment standards legislation. We now have the Newfoundland legislation applying to Matt. Well, that's going to be different than Ontario. You know, I, for many of you know, I'm sure the overtime thresholds are different. Right. Minimum wages are different. Um, although I don't think Matt's working for minimum wage. Um, so but you, the point is you need to know. Health and safety requirements, a whole, ver as you know, occupational health and safety legislation, provincial right across Canada. And so you have material differences between health and safety legislation across Canada, right? And so you're going to have to comply with those requirements, which means you got to take a look and see what you need to do. Corporate tax. Now, I'm no tax expert, but if you you can be deemed a business establishment, depending on what that person does in that remote work environment, and depending on what they do, that they in effect can be considered an establishment for tax purposes, which means then you got to pay provincial tax in that province. So there are corporate tax implications you got to look at, right? Depending on the nature of the job duties and responsibilities of that individual or individuals that are in that province. Payroll withholdings, we're going to talk about that in a second. You have to determine which province governs the payroll withholdings. And we'll talk about that momentarily. Insurance, workplace accidents, right? WSIB, regulatory issues, data privacy laws. In other words, there's a lot to think about. You look in that bottom bullet point, Different legislation applies in each province. If a company's head office in Ontario, if the employee's living and working in Alberta, well, we've got Alberta employment standards legislation applying now. So you need to know it. Okay, next slide, please. I didn't realize there's that much to to follow. Well, and that's it, it, there. They, and it, I'll tell you something. We're just talking about Canada. It, it, it initially in the pandemic you had or early on you had organizations asking questions about people moving internationally and mm -hmm. then there's a whole additional layer of challenges associated with working internationally and most organizations once they realize the complexities of it at least the smaller ones said no no no, no. we're not doing that we're not doing that no way yeah. right well, I, was, I was thinking from like as an employee just moving to a different province i think it's super simple for me just to move right like why why can't i move right but there's there's so much that goes into it with legislation and, and le legalities. Um, I, I, I just couldn't even comprehend that. Yeah. Well, and, and that's what I think. Came, and, and one of the wonderful things about Canada and the ability to move anywhere you want in Canada and work anywhere is wonderful. But we have 10 provinces, three territories, and we have different legislation. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and, and, and so it, it does make a difference. So looking at payroll withholdings. Like who would have kind of thunk about that, right? So typically what you look at for the province of employment is the POE, and it's established in part by the establishment of the employer. So which province are we using? The establishment of the employer. And that typically means, as you see identified there, a premises owned or leased and where employees report to work or from which employees are paid. So, uh, you know, this physical idea of brick and mortar. 
Now, if the employee reports to an establishment in person, the employee's POE is where the establishment's located. And there's no minimum amount of time. So if I physically report to that location, that's the province, that's the POE, that's where the provincial withholdings or the, the provincial withholding tables would apply for that particular individual. Now, but you, if you have a full-time remote agreement, you can still be attached to that same physical location, that province, if it's considered reasonably attached to the establishment. All right, but first we need a fully remote a full remote work agreement. So what does that require? Well, it says must direct or allow the employee to perform their duties 100% remotely. The employment duties are to be performed at one or more locations that are not establishments of the employer. And the employer and employee must have must be able to justify that a full-time remote work agreement was made. So that's not too complicated, but we need to have a full-time remote work agreement. Now, is it attached to the establishment We'll go to the next slide. What's the oh, one, one second? I think we actually yeah. have a poll that we're going to do. Right oh, now. sure. Yeah. So the, the second poll here is, has your organization properly considered the CR, a criteria for the establishment of the province of employment for payroll purposes? And I meant to say the CRA criteria, not CR. Yeah, just. Are you one of those that's not a fan of the CRA? I find there's lots of people that aren't fans of the CRA. Typically about 99% of the population. <laughs> well, that's even the problem, you know, even when you're talking about, you know, having to get involved in, in CRA matters and it's you're kind of going, wow, now I'm implicating mm -hmm. tax issues. Like Stuart, how often do these like changes happen? Like, you know, new changes to le these legislations from a remote work standpoint? Well, you're going to have employment standards legislation constantly change. Ontario, for example, for those of you in Ontario, uh, we started with the Workers for Workers Act one, two, three, four, and we just got up to five. Um, wow. And that, right, so it's, it's a rapid, rapid changes. And you have changes right throughout in BC and Alberta, and you constantly have changes. So uh, yeah, I guess that's why we exist, um, um, I suppose, in part, certainly. So just looking at the numbers, 76, but we have 24% that haven't even considered it, mm. right? And and so, you know, these need to consider it, right? Um, so well, that's good. I'm, it's good, but at least 76% have. So the next slide, we'll look at, so attach the establishment. So we have the remote work agreement, and if, are, are we attached to the establishment for POE purposes? The primary indicator is would the employee physically report their but for the remote work agreement? And then there's secondary indicators as well as you can see listed there. We're not going to go through those in detail, but you can see there are secondary indicators if we can't necessarily determine it from the primary indicator. But messaging being that even in a provincial withholding tax, you have to consider which province applies. Right. OK, next slide, please. OK, so health and safety, same idea as with employment standards. Employers are responsible for ensuring, right, a health and safe work environment for all employees right across Canada and every single province. Um, we've got to consider the workers comp requirements as well. And you've got to register, right? Typically, you've got to register with the board. Right. As soon as you typically hire one employee and a failed failing to register is not a good thing. You can be penalized for that. Right. Um, and the remote work environment is part and parcel of the employer's obligation as it relates to ensuring a health, healthy and safe work environment. Actually, interesting for those in Ontario, uh, in Ontario, you used to have this provision uh, that provided for. Uh, it seemed like the, a, a personal residence wouldn't be considered to be premises for purposes of the Occupational Health and Safety Act, employer premises. Uh, that was just, nobody ever had faith in that, in being able to rely on it, and now it's just been changed. Uh, pursuant to the Workers for Workers Act 5, now the Occupational Health and Safety Act clearly includes remote work now, right, as part of the employer obligation. So, okay, so here's the here's the funny question, call it funny 
Uh, it's a sensitive question because employers, you have the obligation. It's a remote work environment is the workplace. So OSHA applies to you. That's it. And in Ontario, you have language that says you have to take all precautions reasonable in the circumstances. All precautions reasonable in the circumstances. Not some, all. And it, it can essentially apply that throughout Canada. So now we're looking at, all right, so now means we have to look at our employees' work environment. Hmm, well, how do we do that? Well, some of the considerations are, is the workplace large enough for the equipment? Is the furniture stable? Power cords tucked away? Workplace well lit and ventilated? No tripping ha hazards, clear of clutter? How are we doing this, by the way? How are we conducting this audit? We're not marching in and knocking at the door and saying, hi, I understand you make great cookies. Um, can I have some cookies? And while I'm at it, can I take a look at your work area? Um, so you're probably going to ask for it. And many employers will ask for video and, and, and obviously photos of the area so that there can be a consultative process wherein the employer is advising is perhaps some of the things that can be done, right, to enhance safety. And as many of you, or I shouldn't assume that, that it was in the media, Air Canada had an employee who was working at home and she went down for lunch. She went down for lunch at her own home. She tripped on her own carpet, hurt herself, and applied for workers' compensation benefits. And of course, Air Canada said, you got to be kidding. She's on her own personal time. She's going for lunch in her own home like she would do Saturday, Sunday, et cetera, when she's not working, how could that possibly be work-related to which this Quebec court that adjudicated the matter said, no, it absolutely is. Oh, now they're paying benefits. So now, now they're scheduled to employers, so they're paying that themselves, but the point is they're paying for it. So they're paying for that accident in the home. Now, should they have checked the runner on the, on the stairs that she tripped on? Oh, I, I, yeah. You know, but the point is you want to conduct some form of audit. Okay, next slide, please. Well, hey, I, I do want to throw another poll out there and just ask. Oh, the good. Audience. Just a, a basic question here. Does your organization have a remote work health and safety audit protocol? Mm -hmm. Now, remember, folks, it's remote. That's the key. Yeah, I'll give them a minute. And then I, I did want to have a question for you as well, Stuart. Um, maybe we'll just wait for the poll to finish here as well. So, Stuart, should employers ensure they attend at a remote worker's residence to audit the implementation of best safety practices? Okay, it's just sorry. Just does the organizer have remote work health and safety audit protocol? Yes, only twelve percent. Wow, twelve percent. So think about it. So I'll get getting to your question. Think about it. You have an overarching health and safety obligation as an employer as it relates to the workplace, including the remote work environment. And we only have twelve percent of the attend. By the way, that's not surprising. I don't want anybody to feel bad about it. We only have twelve percent of the attendees that have some form of audit process to audit the remote workplace. And you have an overarching obligation to ensure health and safety for those employees working in their own remote, remote work environment. You gotta pay attention to it. So do you show up at somebody's place? No, you're not gonna show up on a now knock on the door, et cetera. You're not doing that. But, if the, but you could have a protocol and some of our clients uh, have asked the question, you know, can we go in and at, which if you're invited in, sure. Um, you know, if you make the arrangement with the employee to go in and say, yeah, we want to help you see, take a look, sure. But obviously that's going to be <laughs> challenging. I mean, I'm not sure everybody's coming out to Newfoundland right now uh, from whom you to check out, right? What's going on in your location, right? It's, it's challenging and not everybody wants it. It's an intrusion into your personal space at some level. Uh, and so, but the point is you should think about for your organization, what you want to do at a bare minimum. You see the listing here, clear of cutter, no tripping hazards, workplace is well lit. So get information from the employee and typically it's going to be images, video image, images or you know, still images, nonetheless, get something 
So you're demonstrating some level of due diligence, which from an occupational health safety standard is certainly what you want to demonstrate. Okay, uh, next slide, please. I want to be cognizant of time. Um, flexible work arrangement and medical accommodation. Well, as we're all probably familiar with in, in, in this webinar today, you have to accommodate under human rights legislation, right? If an employee has some kind of disability and typically that's pretty broad in scope, um, and it's going to also apply in the remote work environment, right? And 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 think about it, that's a little bit more difficult, but you still have to seek to manage that situation to accommodate somebody working in a remote work environment in order to satisfy your legal obligation to accommodate up to undue hardship. Now that's going to be facts and circumstance specific, but I just we just wanted to sensitize you to it. Uh, privacy. You know, there are obviously remote work environment. That's certainly not our expertise in terms of Wi-Fi networks and personal devices that may not be compliant with company standards. You just want to pay attention to that. Um, and obviously the standard strong passwords, firewalls, software updates, data backup, et cetera. The point is you've got privacy issues. And by the way, it can be as also just, you know, an, a, a, a family member looking at documentation on the table. I mean, I, it... it you got to be careful. It's confidential information, right? Um, so, okay, next slide, please. So speaking of that, um, family members over here in confidential phone calls, meetings. How many of you, I experience this all the time, where you go into a Starbucks and you sit down and next to you, people are talking about confidential employment situations. It's always about HR. I find it's always about HR related issues. <laughs> And they're talking freely. I can hear the name. I can hear what the compensation is. I can hear what the performance issues are. I can hear about candidates that are applying for jobs. They do interviews, of course, right next to you sometimes. And there's so much confidential information that is inadvertently shared. And it ought not be. And so if you have a remote work environment, you have to underscore to that employee that, look, you got to make sure everything is uh, not made available to people that are unauthorized. And that's important. Um, and so it's just, you have to make it a point. And sometimes I know organizations just kind of, they just don't direct their minds to it, but you should. You should have something that goes, that goes out clearly to the employee, identifying all these, uh, I'll call it safeguards the employee should take. Next slide, please. Risks and considerations, well, Flexible work, well, the team building, these are the positives, obviously, um, and some of the negatives, of course. Lack of in-person interaction, collaboration, we talked about that. That's a real challenge, uh, depending on the nature of the environment, professional environments, that can be very challenging. Virtual meetings, do they have the same impact as in-person? Um, you know, there are people who have say, well, look, the, the net benefit exceeds the fact that there's a deficiency as it relates to in-person. Maybe true, some would have different views. Uh, a, a perception of lack of support or disconnect. Yeah, I mean, that's not unreasonable uh, to take that position. Productivity, once again, we, we chatted about that. Some will say they're far more productive at home. Uh, others would say, no, uh, there are too many distractions and there's a difference between senior versus junior, certainly, uh, among some other uh, differences as well. Uh, and then the accountability piece as well seems to be less accountability would be the argument for those uh, that are seeking more in-office attendance. Next slide, please. So when we're mitigating risk, what we want to do certainly is consider the obligations under what we chatted about here in part, the employment standards, occupational health and safety, workers' compensation. You need to understand the corporate tax, the income tax act standpoint, and payroll withholdings, right? We need to understand that there are differences, right? As it relates to the policy of remote work, we need to have those policies in place and specific work agreements. And we're gonna look at those now in the next slide. So let's take a look at the policy. If we go to the next slide, well, we'll use an example. So here's an example of a remote work policy. It was not the actual policy, it's what ought to be incorporated in it. Who does it apply to? It may not apply to all the employees in the organization for self-evident reasons. 
There may be an HR issue attached to that, or may, there may not be, because it's so self-evident that the nature of the duties and responsibilities cannot permit remote work. Length of time. Maybe we're just doing it for a pilot project. Short period of time. Then we're going to change it. We're going to evaluate it. So there should be a duration if it if it makes sense. The equipment, right? Do we have the required tools to conduct the work? The location, where can they go, right? Can they just all of a sudden tell you, oh, I now live in Newfoundland. And nobody knew, well, what? Matt's where? Um, so, you, right, we need to understand there should be some process where that's discussed and whether there's an authorization to permit it. Health and safety, we chatted about that in terms of those risks. Um, and once again, the idea of we can change it when we want, modify it, cancel it at our discretion in bright lights, neon signs, music plays with it. So everybody knows. Next slide, please. Sir, sir we're going to do another poll here. But yes. Last, yeah, we'll, we'll do the poll first. And then I do have a question I want to ask you after. So poll question number one, does your organization have Folsom policy regarding remote work? And second one is, does the remote work policy clearly set out the organization's discretion to cancel or amend the policy? Okay. Yeah, Stuart, I was, I was just going to ask that question, like, um, you know, should employers ensure that, um, you know, like, if the employer has a remote, remote work policy already and they just created it, but they've already had employees that were working remotely. So when they do create it, is that going to then be enforceable? But if they haven't reserved the right to change it uh, or after, sorry, you're asking if you now have a policy, but it's after employees have already been working remotely. Yeah. Like they've already been yes. working remotely and then you just create this new policy. Yeah. It's, it's not in a clear answer. The, the, you still want to have the policy. You would still make sure everybody ha so look at this does your organization have fulsome policy only 40 percent does remote work policy clearly set out the discretion to cancel only 43 percent so yeah so there's really need some work to do uh to you know protect the interests of the organization so to answer your question you still do it um and what will happen is yes if the next day at, let's say somebody's been doing it for five years you you circulate the policy and then you say that after you circulate the policy, okay, we're getting rid of remote work. All right. So the people who have been doing it for five years are going to say constructive dismissal still. I don't care that you circulated the policy today. Right. And then told, so you still do it, but over time it will be elevated to a term of employment. Now there's another way of doing it where you give legal consideration in exchange, but I, we don't have the time to go through it. Um, it's when you make any change in terms and conditions of employment that are that are that compromise arguably the employee's interests. You can always cut a new deal with that employee, but you have to give them something of value. So if I give the employee, you know, a bonus the employee doesn't have, here's five hundred dollars, and now you're going to agree to this remote work provision. Sure, that's clearly you can do that, but uh, you know there's sort of practical implications to that. Um, so I'll just leave it at that for the moment. But you certainly can do that. Okay, let's go to remote work agreement, I believe. Next slide, Will. So this is the same idea. Sometimes you want to do individualized deals with, right, employees, right? It may not be sort of across the board. So you can enter into an individualized deal that will have really some of the same uh, components that we just talked about with the policy. Length of time, location, right? Where they conduct their work, reporting requirements, right? Who are they reporting to, the equipment, the expenses, <laughs> Are they allowed to expense time and attention? Where are you going to, you know, what are the hours that you're supposed to be at and proverbially online, right? And once again, those amendments that we can change it whenever we want. Okay. But so just think of it sometimes. Yes, you can have a broad policy application to all the employees, but sometimes you want an individualized agreement. It's going to depend on the circumstances. So just that was the idea to sensitize you to that. Okay. Next slide, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to be mindful of time here. Like, we're happy to stick around a little longer if folks have to go. I do want to answer some questions from the audience as well. Okay. So just the hybrid work policies, this is the same idea. We want the agreements. And this is just underscoring the point of have a policy in place, 
right? Or an agreement. And once again, the idea of length of time, reporting requirements, time and attention, equipment amendments, same refrain, set it out in writing, ensure you reserve the discretion. Okay. Stuart, Stuart what about like a, a trial? Like, is there a way like a, an employer could just do like a trial work remote policy uh, to test it out? Absolutely. And in fact, you should do that. In fact, even in our own environment, we've, we're playing with it a little and we just changed it a little. We've modified it a little. And we said, we're going to pilot this. And it's not so much that, yes, the legal protection is in the language that we've used, but it's all, it, it's more of an HR thing to say to everybody, look, we're going to try this for a little bit and we're going to see, we're going to evaluate and it may change. And, uh, so everybody don't get too comfortable. Okay. Because it may change and we're telling you up front. Right. So it, it's more of an HR uh, issue. I, I mean, yes, you need, still need to have that legal sort of protection language in place. But but from an HR standpoint, you know, like everything else in life, it's about communication. Right. And if you communicate clearly and set the expectations, nobody can take the position reasonably that they were somehow surprised. Right. Uh, they were sandbagged by the by the change by the employer. So. That's what you want to do. So yes, you can absolutely. And in fact, I would encourage it um, if, if that's the sort of approach. Absolutely. Next slide, Will, if we can do that. Uh, same idea with the other flexible work arrangements. Reduce it to writing, right? Set it out in an agreement or a policy. Uh, you can have rules pertaining to hours of work, break times, overtime, right? All of those things. Remember, you're governed by the employment standards legislation of the province where that remote employee is located, right? So once again, the idea of overtime, break times, hours of work, all those things apply. So you need to educate yourself on what that is. Okay, I think where, let's see, what's the next slide, Will? Ah, there we are. Okay, so just quick conclusion, flexible work arrangements, it's the reality of life, we're in it. It seems like we're in it for the long term. It's far from over that evolution. Who knows what the future brings? Um, and important that you communicate clearly what the expectations are, just like what Matt was asking right now. Reduce it to a policy, reduce it to an agreement, reserve the right, right to make changes and make sure you appreciate the legislative framework in those provinces where your remote employees are. And there we go. Perfect. Perfect. Well, okay. That's great. So I, there are some great questions asked in the, the Q and a channel. So I'm going to say a couple right now, Stuart. And again, if we don't get to all of them, we'll definitely, uh, we'll send that out to you guys. So the first, uh, anonymous question is we have a hybrid work policy with opportunities of flex time. We've communicated the policy via internal updates. But would it be better to have them acknowledge sign off via our LMS? And if someone is in violation of this policy after acknowledging it, does it become a performance issue? So a sign off is no lawyer. Every lawyer will tell you, sure, I'd love a sign off. So I don't have to establish that the employee received it and had the opportunity to review it. In most cases, the employee will have had the opportunity to see it and you can demonstrate the employee presumably had the opportunity to review it. But by signing off, the employee's demonstrating that clearly and there's no dispute. So yes, ideally, you would have some form of sign off. And there's no question if an employee fails to comply with the requirements under that policy, that's a performance issue. Indeed, it may be a disciplinary issue as well. Um, so no question about it. You've created the expectation for the employee, your expectation for the employee. Um, the employee has signed off in agreeing in effect, or at least acknowledging. Um, by the way, that sign off doesn't have to be, nor should it be, quite frankly. It should not be, oh, I agree with these terms. It's no, I acknowledge receipt of it. Uh, you're not asking for the employee to agree, right? Unless there's a major compromise scenario well, I discussed moments ago where you might need legal consideration, but putting that aside. Uh, so short answer is great to get a sign off. And yes, 
you can absolutely rely on a failure to comply as a performance issue that indeed may form part of a performance appraisal, may form part ultimately of any kind of performance improvement plan, and indeed may indeed be disciplinary. So yes, short answer, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, next question. Um, very quick question here. Being that you have employees in, let's say, two provinces, won't Canada labor laws apply? No. Okay, good question. I understand why. So that question, if I think I understand the question, federal legislation, so the Canada Labor Code, only applies to organizations that are engaged in activities that are governed constitutionally federally. So banking, telecommunications, aeronautics, those things, those area shipping, those business activities are governed federally and the Canada Labor Code applies. If you're not engaged in those business activities, and of which the vast majority of businesses are not, then you're governed provincially. And as we've chatted about, depending on where your employees are typically located, the provincial employment legislation will apply to those employees. So the federal legislation is irrelevant, has no application whatsoever to organizations that are engaged in activity that's governed provincially, which is the vast majority of organizations. Okay, so that's, I know sometimes and it gets mixed up with the corporate side when you incorporate federally versus provincially. But if you're in, if you do software, if you do manufacturing, if you do consulting, if you do right, all virtually most things other than those, some of those that I mentioned right now are governed provincially. So the fact that you're in two provinces, Alberta, BC, Alberta led employment legislation will apply. BC employment legislation will apply to those in BC. All right. Here's a great scenario I want to share with you. So we have an employee who works 100% remotely in BC. Our head office is, is in Ontario. The statutory holidays are, in, are different in BC than Ontario. Can we substitute some BC statutory holidays to align with our Ontario holidays? Or does the employee need to agree to that change? You have to check the, the employment standards legislation of BC, right? So can you do a substitute day? You may be able to do a substitute day. I just off top of my head, I uh, can't recall, but you may be able to do that and do a substitute day and that's fine. And then, you, and, and, and whatever the substitute day requirements are in BC, you would apply and then, you know, use the Ontario days. That's, and, that's yeah. fine. But the, does the employee also need to agree to this change? Not depending on the legislation. Yeah. Right? It's not really, you want their agreeance. It's more like their acknowledgement again. <laughs> Right. It depends. It depends, uh, right, on what the legislation provides as it relates to the sub, you know, doing a substitute day. Right. It may not require any kind of employee agreement. It just has to be scheduled within a certain period of time. Right. So mm -hmm. it just the point. That's why I have to look at the legislation um, and determine whether that's available in the circumstances. Right. Yeah. Um, what one other question here um, might want to elaborate here, though, but uh, would a questionnaire asking employees to do a voluntary health and safety of their home office, would that suffice? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. You you have a list of a whole bunch of questions and just ask the employees, listen, can you can you respond to these questions? Um, assuming questions are good enough. Once again, images are can be valuable, um, but but. That I think that's a great start, certainly, to create some kind of checklist. And then, you know, are the cords tucked away properly? Do you have, you know, going through the whole list, right, of, of potential hazards? And, and, and then that would be a form of audit. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Fantastic. Um, okay, one more question here. Um, if an employer allows occasional work from home as opposite to complete remote work, are there the same health and safety implications and requirements? Well, if there's a case, yeah, I mean, you're, you're permitting work under the roof of the individual's resident, personal residence. Um, and if that's, I'll call it, I you'd want to check the legislation across Canada, but typically if it's going to be I'll call it somewhat regular. 
then in all likelihood, it's going to be considered the workplace, right? Um, and, you know, if it's, and then all the attendant occupational health and safety obligations would attach. Mm -hmm. um, so any degree of regularity likely catapults it. Um, once again, you want to just check, like, for example, the employment standard and the occupational health and safety legislation was just amended here in Ontario now to deal with remote work. Right. So you, 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 you want to yeah. take a look and make sure. But as I, I just probably as a general approach, that would probably apply. Right. Yeah. And uh, Stuart, I'm sure you can help with all of these matters. And um, how, do, how do people get a hold of you? Yeah, I think, in fact, I think in this deck, there's a, uh, I think we're going to have a, uh, where any of the attendees can communicate. Well, there we are, e2rsolutions.com. Anybody who goes on that website will see there's a uh, uh, an ability to contact us. All you do is contact us and we'll reach out to you right away. Just say hi and we'll reach out to you right away and we'll set up a uh, you know, quick call. Basically, anybody who wants to chat about our service, you, you, basically it's one coffee and we're done. Um, uh, it's a pretty straightforward, very low cost program. Um, we don't lock you in for fixed term contracts. Like you couldn't have it any better. Um, from my client side, which is why, uh, thankfully, once again, uh, it's a gratifyingly successful program because it, ma it meets all the requirements the clients have. They don't want to lock in. They want low cost. They want robust support and they want it across Canada. Well, that's us. Yeah. For sure. For sure. They also um, have a really cool thing on LinkedIn called, uh, is it E2R in H a car? HR in a car. HR, HR in a car. It's on our website. It's actually the, on our website where we were actually do two to three minute videos where we're driving in the car. We talk about a singular HR legal issue and we couch it in comedy, believe it or not. <laughs> um, and uh, clients, we did it as a lark about four years ago and clients said, you're not allowed to stop. So I think mm -hmm. we're up to about 104 videos or something that you can see uh, on our website right on. and on LinkedIn as well. Thanks, Matt. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, and just so you guys all know, I, I've worked with Stuart uh, for probably the last eight years with multiple different vendors. I've referred them um, a lot of business when it comes to solving HR and legal needs. So highly trusted. We as Humi, we we wanted to partner with them. We, we truly believe in what they do over there is, is super successful. So I do encourage all of you to follow, to reach out to Stuart, to reach out to E2R, just to mitigate potential risks from ever happening and just to gain some more insight into those legal issues. So with that being said, um, that will conclude our webinar today. Thanks everyone so much for joining. And uh, I look forward to seeing all of you on the next webinar. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye, everyone.